Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Thank you. That's and, a good week. Uh, Can you yeah. <laughs> It's a real honor. My name is Andy Tepper, and I'm co-chair of the International Committee here at the Brooklyn Book Festival. Can you hear me? Yeah. And it's a real pleasure to have these three writers here. Um, uh, they'll be signing books afterwards at the Greenlight Bookstore uh, book st uh, stand right outside in the, in the lobby. And let me um, give a short introduction, and then we'll start. Uh, I'll start with some questions, and we'll do readings, and then we'll have uh, time for Q&A afterwards. Um, the topic is uh, breaking the silence, hidden stories. And uh, the idea really was um, to, to kind of find uh, stories within the narratives of these three novels by these writers that tell stories that are central to the modern uh, stories of their countries, of their nations, but also stories of families, of personal stories, lives caught in, in the midst of upheaval. So we're going to get to that. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Atish Tassir. Uh, he's the author of the memoir, Stranger to History, A Son's Journey Through Islamic Lands, and three novels, The Temple Goers, which was shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award, and the highly acclaimed Noon, and The Way Things Were, which was published uh, this year by Forrest Strauss and Giroux. His work has been translated into more than a dozen languages, and uh, he lives in New Delhi and New York. We're very lucky to have him in New York right now. So thank you, Atish. Uh, Uh, Eka Kurniawan, born in 1974, is the author of novels, short stories, essays, movie scripts, and graphic novels. He's been described as one of the most influential writers in Indonesia today. He, uh, his new novel is Beauty is the Wound and also Man Tiger, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. you don't have to say it here, I I, yeah, I don't yeah. have to say it. <laughs> Tai Selassie is an author and photographer, born in London, raised in Boston. Uh, she, in 2005, she published the seminal essay, Bye Bye Babar, or What is an Afropolitan, uh, offering an alternative vision of African identity uh, for a transnational generation. <laughs> That's what's written here. In 2011, she made her fiction debut with The Sex Lives of African Girls, selected for Best American Short Stories 2012. And in 2013, her first novel uh, was published, Ghana Must Go and it was selected as one of the 10 best books of 2013 by the Wall Street Journal and The Economist. So, oh. <laughs> I, was, I was telling Andy that he doesn't have to say the year a woman writer was born. <laughs> it's just so I, I wanted to start by just setting the framework, the historical framework of the novels. And I'll start with Atish, because your novel um, jumps through decades, but it, it tells a story that is very central to modern India, and it begins in, you can tell us the year and, and the events. Um, the, I, I think that the, the, why was the time important to me? I think 75 was the year that the novel begins with the emergency, which is the first period where the sort of democracy of India is compromised, and it's sort of, these are countries coming out of uh, a colonial history, and there's a sort of idealism about that time, and 1975 is the first moment where the story starts to, starts to go sour. And um, so that's, the, that's where we, we enter the, the lives of this family and of this novel. It leads us through 1984, which is in some ways a very, very dark period in Indian history. It was the year um, of the, Mrs. Gandhi's assassination, which was not the darkest part. But what followed were very violent riots. Um, in which almost two or three thousand Sikhs were killed in the streets of Delhi, uh, in what was almost like a pogrom. And um, the novel ends in the demolition of this mosque, which kind of uh, probably is the moment that sort of uh, foreshadows the, the modern period of, of Hindu nationalism and of that kind of politics coming into the fray. So that, that was all, th that, those years were always in my mind as a sort of fictional backdrop for the book. Um, yeah, and and Eka, tell tell us about the the uh, the span of your book. I mean, it it it's uh, spans the 20th century, but it's central to the uh, Suharto regime of the 1960s. Yeah, the book uh, was published in 2002. It's actually uh, four years after Suharto resigned from 
presidency. Uh, so I think it, it's it, for us, it's like a kind of new era. So I think for me to, I want to write something, something like, uh, you know, for for three uh, for thirty-two years, Indonesia have a kind of official history. Uh, we know nothing about uh, actually. So uh, I think in my novel, I want to uh, recreate this kind of story from. Uh, from early, uh, from the end of colonial era to uh, independence, to op Japan occupation, and uh, the mass killing of communists in 1965, and then to the the coming of to Harto uh, regime. So I think I, I don't I, I don't try to correct uh, the official history, but I think I want to uh, try to recreate an alternate uh, history of my own country. Yeah. And, and, and tell you, tell, tell us about your book. I mean, I know in the background is the Biafran War in the 60s, but the, the story goes uh, through the 80s and 90s. Right, so the title, Ghana Must Go, refers to an incident in January of 1983 when right. the government of Nigeria, um, famous to this day for its ineptitude, issued an executive order um, expelling all Ghanaians from the country and giving them about 48 hours to leave. Um, the bags in which they packed their things while fleeing are now also to this day known as Ghana Must Go Bags, yeah, yeah. which is um, probably the, the symbol that points most to this story, this, this idea of forced and hasty exile, I think, is central to the lives of this family. But I would say that for me, you, you said that we're talking about stories about nation that are also stories about family, but for me, this is a story about a family yeah, yeah. Um, that is comprised of individuals who come from different nations. Right. Quite the other way around, I think perhaps as distinct from our co-panelists. Right. right. Um, no, I feel the same way. Oh, you the, do? The people, the family comes first. I mean, it has to, it in has a way. To. Un unless you're writing about the, uh, my friends are here who know I'm very fussy about this word nation, <laughs> because I think it can be, can, are we talking about a nation or a nation state or a country? But let's say that Indonesia and India and Ghana and Nigeria are kind of sovereign states. <laughs> so we can call them states. If we're talking about the state, that is obviously the background that is, and sometimes a very violent context for human life. But I think as novelists, we tend to be most concerned with the human life itself yeah. and perhaps the background as it bears on the people. I'm actually sometimes very embarrassed about the intrusion of these big events always. Yeah. And, and, and I think that it was because that time was, was the kind of time where it was actually natural. But people couldn't help but think about politics. Yeah. And actually when politics starts to sort itself out, people can get by without thinking about it. You know, so it's... Um, I teach there's a wonderful passage in your book. Shall I read it? Or yeah, why don't you read it? <laughs> <laughs> where the, the character says, um, uh, our literature is crammed full of big events, of riots and partitions and emergencies. Some must ask, is this really the stuff of everyday life? Mm -hmm. Surely some people must be just living quiet lives with quiet problems, unaffected by those cataclysms. And my answer is no. It is as Naipaul says, the train has many coaches in different classes, but it passes through the same landscape. People are responding to the same political or religious and cultural pressures. I underlined that like in 17 book. times. <laughs> and then book. after I underlined it, I highlighted it again. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, th this is probably a, a incredible summation of how I feel about the challenge of writing about human beings who, through no fault of their own or through no doing of their own, happen to be born in states that are permanently on the brink of various forms of collapse. Because that would you, we're thinking when you, I mean, were you trying to write a national story of Indonesia? Or? Yeah, I think uh, my novel always talk about about a uh, human character, uh, about a family, but I think uh, politically uh, every character is, is always uh, different um, from uh, political situations, uh, the, the big event, the small event, I think uh, what, whatever happened, whatever happened to 
a country like Indonesia, it, uh, it uh, will influence your characters in, in daily life, mm -hmm. in their daily life. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, in, my, in my novel, characters like uh, Devi Ayu is a half Indonesian, half Dutch. Uh, he, he's just, uh, uh, when the, the, the books open, he, she is just a teenager. Uh, uh, she's not involved in the political in the war, but but the war and the political situations uh, influenced so much uh, to her and to her family and even uh, almost uh, fourth generation of her family. It's, it's interesting because, Atish, your character, uh, Toby, this, this main character, is also an outsider in many ways, right? I mean, he's viewed as, uh, to Indians as, as, as being an outsider, and his idea of India is, is a little uh, detached from the daily reality. So tell me more, yeah, more about um, him. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, with him, he, it's, uh, it's kind of a, the, the one of the beauties of his vision is that he has this very clear vision of classical India because of his relationship with Sanskrit. And um, it's something pretty enchanting in many ways, but it also blinds him to the reality of the place. So he thinks he has a kind of false sense of comfort in India. He feels like he, he, he knows it so deeply mm -hmm. that he can operate and, and actually he becomes probably the biggest casualty of the novel because uh, he's, he's hopelessly naive and, and India shows him that very roughly. So, um, yeah. Yeah, there's a section where it says, it was not so much blood or riots that he feared, he had seen all that before. It was the corruption of his dream, the dream of renaissance turned to nightmare. Well, this is the, I mean, I, I think that maybe Tai will be sympathetic with this feeling as well as that, you know, I think in these countries, coming out of a certain kind of history, the, the, the feeling was, how is one going to renew an old culture? And, and I, I think of it as more relevant today than at any other time, because if, if there's one thing we can say about our time, it's that history with a capital H is back in our lives. There's, a, there's a, mm -hmm. people, in fact, who are very ill-equipped to deal with history, are anxious about the past in ways that you almost it, even right from the heart of, of, of ISIS, you can feel this anxiety related to history. And, uh, and, and in, in this novel, the, 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 the question of renewal is pretty central. It's, it's how one might be made new by the past. And obviously the great danger is that instead of capturing the spirit of the past, you end up trying to repeat the past. And so what Toby's fears, what he fears here is that rather than real renewal, uh, this, this, this vision of the past becomes almost a kind of tyranny. It becomes a, a, a source of bloodshed. And then it's also, I don't know, you may be sympathetic to this, <laughs> but it's also very difficult to speak of the past and the singular, because everyone on that train that you're speaking of will have a different view of the landscape in the present moment, and then a completely different memory of the landscape past in, in the future. So, so the past, the spirit of the, pa the past, I always feel that we are obliged to speak of the pasts because we're, or histories, they're, yeah. they're, they're always plural and most often in competition. Even in a family, even, even at the micro level, even at the personal level, I believe this to be so. No, I think that's probably true and, I, and the, way that, uh, the way that we give shape to the past, it, it, there's, this, there's this sense that, in fact, uh, a moment where he's talking about um, Katsaya's idea and he says that the sense of history is to actually uh, to, to see, the, to recognize the past as a shaping force upon the present and what you find in countries like mine and perhaps in, perhaps in several others, perhaps in the Turkey of today and the Sri Lanka, is that certain needs of the present are almost used to reshape the past, to remake history, to suit uh, the needs, to see, suit the political needs of the present. Of, of, of yeah. the present. Could I quickly um, ask if Yes, of course. Ask, ask, a, oh. ask what? Hello, audience. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask if, um, how many of you had been to Indonesia? Indonesia, okay. Okay, and India, and Nigeria, and Ghana. <laughs> no, not a bad showing. Or not a bad not showing bad at, at all. all. Wonderful. <laughs> I love Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I asked this question in Germany, and they're like, yeah. "What? No, no hands? <laughs> no, hands. no hands? 
Hooray for Brooklyn. Hooray for Brooklyn. Let's talk about the families and start with you, Ty. Tell me um, how they come undone, how they fractured in, in your book. What, what are the forces that are um, that pulling them apart? Yeah. It's funny, the, the panel is called I Breaking... I mean, there's secrets, yeah. yeah. There's secrets within them and the relationships That's shift. right, Breaking the Silence, yeah. which I know is meant to refer to sort of the unspoken histories of these countries, it but I would say... That, yeah, yeah, I, I would say that it is silence that tears yeah. this family apart. Yeah, yeah. It is, the, um, it is the fact that every family member has a different version right. of the events that shaped that family history. And it is the fact that each of these individuals has remained silent on the subject of how those histories have hurt and shaped them and how the love that they have for each other hurts and feeds them. And, yeah. and so in a sense, it is by breaking the silence yeah. that this family begins to put itself back together. Yeah. Slowly. And Atish, tell us about your book is about a marriage that is, is unraveling over these decades yeah. with, with, with these big events as the backdrop. Yeah, it's definitely the dissolution of the marriage. Is, but uh, in a front, like, I, and this was p part of the problem when I was trying yeah. to write it, was that I thought, I kept trying to write it straight, and it wouldn't come that yeah. way. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I must have mm. thrown away a whole yeah. novel mm. of, of false starts. Yeah. And it was till that moment where Skanda, who's the, the son, son yeah. Uh, till I was able to create a narrative structure in which you could feel right. the weight of the past on him, yeah. and then the material started to move. So I would say that, of course, it's about the dissolution of a marriage, but it's also about this character trying to sort of set himself free mm. of the past. Mm. But do you think that, so you're saying you tried to write it in a linear, chronological way, and then it wouldn't come, and then when you... Exactly. Broke that open well, and became a bit acronym. The, the I know, son I know. returns to India with the ashes of his father. And the minute there and was that remember. dual narrative, and you could feel the weight, or you could feel the past kind of mm -hmm. come up as a sort of flood, and against the present, right. then, then the tension was there. Right. Otherwise, it seemed to me like a nightmare of yeah. a family saga that I didn't want to write, <laughs> you know? But do you think that, do you, I, I can never, well, maybe I'm projecting, but I can never, I can never write linearly. Yeah. And I've, I've, I just can't do it. And I've started to wonder whether that's because we don't live linearly. Because as we sit here in the present moment, we are, we are all of us, in spite of ourselves, thinking of the past, reflecting on the past, informed by the past, projecting to the future, thinking of the next things we have to do today and this month and this year and this life. And so any moment that is said to be existing in the present is actually containing sort of the past, present, and the future. Therefore, the richest and the truest um, fiction that I read, anyway, and certainly the only kind of fiction that I can write, works that way, too. Yeah. In any moment, there's always memory and hope, memory and hope, always figurating around the characters as they move through the story. Yeah. No? Um, kind of? No, and, and in fact, a lot of the, before, like, this kind of the, the sort of, dictatorship of the 19th century omniscient novel kind of kicked in, right. a lot of the old stories were non-linear. A lot of right. them had, there was, there's a professor of mine at Columbia who works on ring theory in the old stories, and they worked much more like a kind of echo than an arc, you know, and would, so yeah. Yeah, I think we work that way too. Yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, you can. The story, I think the story is always the same, uh, tall, the linear or not, because I think, People always read it linearly from first page to uh, the last page. And, but I think even if the story is not linear, uh, even if the story is linear, people uh, in, the, in the middle or in somewhere have this, uh, their own discretion thinking or to around there, here or there, and backward, forward to the story. I think it's, it's always the same. It's just a form of literary. And I wanted to ask you also about, I mean, your your family and your yeah. story is several generations and it's a very unusual family. Um, there's uh, people come back from the dead, yeah. there's ghosts, there's a lot of magical elements. So tell me more about how you created a family that you wanted to Yeah, actually, write about. Uh, when, uh, when, when, when I wanted to write this novel, I want to write uh, a ghost story, but I think this ghost is an uh, important ele element for Indonesian history, you know, uh, 
in uh, everything in Indonesia is his, everything in his Indonesian history is like a ghost. So I think this element is so important because uh, you know in this this uh, family uh, in this novel, uh, the ghost is haunted in everywhere from the first uh, first uh, story when uh, the when this uh, this woman uh, raised from the grave. Uh, he is, uh, he is not, he, she is not only uh, a ghost, but he, she is haunted by another ghost. So I think uh, it's a, I think it's a, a small, a kind of perfect, uh, uh, a perfect uh, icon for Indonesian history. A metaphor, can I, yeah. I can, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you yes. a question? Unfortunately, I haven't gotten to read Beauty is a Wound yet, but you mentioned should I read it now? <laughs> but I'll just thumb through it while we talk. Um, but you mentioned a half Dutch, half Indonesian yeah. character, and I'm, I'm always sort of perennially fascinated by mixed characters. As, as you can probably see, I'm half Nigerian and half Kenyan. <laughs> Very um, contentious I'm, I'm half mix. Indian, half Pakistan. Do you see what I mean? Well done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is where the juice is. We people. wanted to set up the panel like that. <laughs> um, and so I wondered how that character, she, functions as an outsider, insider, insider, outsider. Yeah, yeah. What team are you playing for, home or away or both, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. I think, I think it's a, a great, great. I, I have to invention this because I think Indonesia is a, it's a, uh, a question about identity. There is an, the original identity of my country. I think the Indonesia is like a, uh, half foreign blood, half uh, indigenous blood. Even I, I think with this character Dewi Ayu, half Indonesian, half that I can to see the world from inside and outside. Even she is not only half Dutch and half Indonesian. He's changed. Uh, he, he's changed a religion too. He's, he can see the world from Catholic perspective and then from Muslim perspective. So like the. Uh, I think it's uh, it's funny to see uh, the the theme from uh, the multiple perspective. Yeah, and is she accepted as Indonesian by the other characters in the novel? And uh, not really, but uh, she always said uh, my name is Dewi Ayu, and um, it is uh, Indonesian name. So because uh, uh, her look is um, more like that, uh, so she has to. Uh, said it's uh, it's time to other people that uh, I am an Indonesian. And do you believe that she is? Yes, I, I am. <laughs> okay. I was thinking maybe we should do some readings. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Atish, do you want to start? Okay. Um, it's. Uh, it's a very small uh, passage, but uh, it's uh, an important one. It's a, uh, we're in 1984, and uh, it's quite soon after the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi, and it's the prelude uh, to the violence. And I, the story had come to me. It was a family story of, uh, of taxi drivers, because many of the, the city's taxi drivers are six, and um, they had shown up at the house of this... Uh, old Sikh family asking refuge and, and then had defended the hotel. And, um, and this is a description of them coming. Um, Toby had just come back to the flat. Uma was in the bathroom. He sat down to wait for her to come out and found himself trying under changed circumstances to resume the routine of the morning. He had just picked up the Hindustan Times. The headline read, Indra Gandhi shot dead when the taxis began to arrive. They had the air of able-bodied men coming to sign up for a war effort or, do or donate blood or desert the army of a leader who had turned tyrannical. There was that same solemnity of purpose, that same quiet resolve, that same hint of fear, masked or banished by the sanctity of a higher cause to which in some private moment of reckoning they had committed themselves completely. Stern, jut-sick faces, bearded and lined, the eyes vast and liquid, Faces that even in good times had a kind of latent thunder about them, but which now seemed battle-ready, seemed to exude a terrible strength. They came through the iron gates in ones and twos, then in a steady stream of threes and fours, they gave a little nod of Satsvikal to their red turban tribesmen and co-religionist who manned the door of the hotel, 
Then stepping out of their taxis and following the example of the oldest among them, they removed their turbans and placed them in a row on the marble staircase of the hotel. And without a word to each other, they stood in silence, seeming to await orders. Their faces were expressionless, but for what Toby thought, watching this spectacle was the faintest trace of racial pride, a quiet acknowledgement that if they were to lose this fight, it would only be because they were grossly outnumbered. And yet, as many of them would later say, this was how it had always been with the six. Thank you, Atish. There's a wonder that There's a very striking image in the book where a character shape, cuts his hair and shaves his beard in the bathroom and then sneaks out and, and escapes. That's a really powerful yeah. scene. Just, well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just a very real, uh, because we have this theme of history throughout, that for him was yeah. like a very real, very physical way of being free of the past. And yeah. there's a moment, the title comes from the Sanskrit word for history, and yeah. at one moment when he wants to leave, uh, Toby, he says to him, I want to go to a place without Itihasa, without history. Yeah. And Toby says, what, America, Australia? <laughs> he says, no, even less, Canada or New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> what is the Sanskrit word for history? Itihasa. Meaning? The way things were. That's the title, yeah. Literally. Yeah. Okay. It actually means the way things indeed were. The way things indeed were. Yeah. It covers... I always think that legend. you should just put indeed in sentences when you can. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> but, and is this history of the Sikhs community within India often overlooked? Um, you know, it, it, they're a small community. They're, they, they're an offshoot of Hinduism. They've in some ways incorporated many aspects from Islam. They were born... But, I mean, they're involved in these mass riots and violence. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's a martial history, and it, and it's at least in the parts of India where they have a population, people know about them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, and they, they, they're some of the most uh, industrious, widely traveling people in the world. There are six, or well, most of the many the many people who drive taxis in New York. Yes, of six, course. You yeah. know, so so it's and some of them came during the time in the 80s when there was all that trouble. Yeah. Tai, would you like sure. to read? Yeah. I'll read a little bit um, from the part of the novel that I suppose kind of touches on this issue of being a human being caught up in history and what the indignities of that can be. So this is the mother in the novel. Her name is Fola, and she left Nigeria at the outbreak of the Biafran War. So she says, this was the problem and would be ever after, the block on which she sometimes feels her whole being stumbled, that he, and so she, became so unspecific in an instant that the details didn't matter in the end. Her life until that moment had seemed so original, a richly spun tale with a bright cast of characters. She, motherless princess of a vertical palace, their four-story apartment on Victoria Island, they, passionate, glamorous friends of her father's staff, he, widowed king of the castle. Had he died a death germane to this life as she'd known it, in a car crash, for example, in his beloved de chevaux, or from liver cancer, lung, to the end, puffing cow, swimming rum, she could have abided the loss, would have mourned, would have found herself an orphan in a four-story apartment, having lost both her parents at 13 years old, but would have been thus bereaved a thing she recognized, tragic, instead of what she became, a part of history, generic. She sensed the change immediately in the tone people took when they learned that her father had been murdered by soldiers in the way that they'd nod as if, yes, all makes sense, the beginning of the Nigerian Civil War, but of course. Never mind that the houses were targeting Igbos, and her father was a Yoruba, and her grandmother Scottish, and the house staff Fulani, some Indian even, ten dead, one an Igbo, minor details, no matter. She felt it in America when she got to Pennsylvania, having been taken for Stigana by the kindly Senna Wosunu, that her classmates and professors, white or black, it didn't matter, somehow believed that it was natural, however tragic, what had happened, that she'd stopped being Fola Share Somayina Savage, and had become instead the native of a generic war-torn nation without specifics, without the smell of rum or posters of the Beatles or a kente blanket tossed across a king-sized bed or portraits, just 
some war-torn nation, hopeless and inhuman and as humid as a war-torn nation anywhere, all war-torn nations everywhere. How had this happened? It wasn't Lagos she longed for, the splendor, the sensational, the sense of being wealthy, but the sense of self surrendered to the senselessness of history, the narrowness and naivete of her former individuality. After that, she simply ceased to bother with the details, with the notion that existence took its form from its specifics, whether this house or that one, this passport or that, whether Baltimore or Lagos or Boston or Accra, whether expensive clothes or hand-me-downs or florist or lawyer or life or death didn't much matter in the end. If one could die identityless, estranged from all context, then one could live estranged from all context as well. This is the part when Dewi Ayu, uh, how he, Dewi Ayu become a prostitute. But she didn't have the money. Her five remaining rings would never be enough to buy a house. Her only hope, her treasure, was still in the toilet and she would never be able to get at it without owning the house first. She met with Mama Kalong straight away, knowing that the woman was always quick to help anyone in need and spoke as frankly as possible. Mama, loan me some money. I want to buy my house back, she said. Mama Kalong looked at everything from a finance, financial angle and could always spot a good business opportunity. And how will you repay me, she asked. It. I have family tree, sir, replied Devi Ayu. Before the war, I buried all my grandmother's jewelry in a secret place and no one knows about it except me and God. And what if God stole it? Then I'll come back and whore for you to pay off my debt. They agreed on this as the best possible idea. Mama Kalong even offered to become the medi mediator for the repurchasing of the house because if Dewi Ayu did it herself, there was the possibility that old guerrilla woman would refuse to sell. A native would never trust her with her Dutch appearance, and plus Mama Kalong was more experienced in buying properties from people like them who needed money. She promised Dewi Ayu she would bargain for the lowest possible price. The whole business took almost a week. Mama Kalong went back and forth every day to meet with this fierce woman before finishing the transaction. The old Grilia granny agreed to sell the house if she could get another house and some cash in exchange. Mama Kalong handed it well so that she could finally order the woman to leave the house and threaten her to, to never set foot there again. Accompanied by Mama Kalong, Dewi Ayu quickly moved in with her two small children using a military jeep that belonged to a key NIL customer to the whole house. How happy Dewi Ayu was to return to her home with the assurance that it now belonged to her. So when will you pay me back, asked Mama Kalong finally. Give me one month's time. Yes, that's enough for an self-vacation, she said. If someone disturbs you your house, you just come to me. I have good friends who are guerrilla and I know key and IL soldiers. They are all my customers. They work all day while Mira was the two little kids. They only stopped for a moment to eat and rest before continuing to dismantle the concrete and steal what was left of the seat that had already turned into dirt. But they didn't find anything except on really writing earthworms. Debbie Ayu was sure that they had already removed all the excrement and soil from the pipes, but she still hadn't found any of jewelry and she had put there. There were no necklaces and no golden bracelet. There were only mounds of rotting earth, brown and humid. She didn't believe that the jewelry could have rotten away with the seed. So she quickly abandoned her work and gave up, grumbling. God stole it. Thank you. Eka, I wanted to ask you a question about young, young writers in Indonesia. In your bio, it's interesting on this book, um, Beauty is the Wound, it says, that you were born in West Java on November 28, 1975, the day that the little ex-Portuguese colony East Timor declared its sovereign independence. 
Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, luckily that I, I was born at the same day with the <laughs> independence of, the first independence of East Timor. And, and you were saying that Suharto uh, died in, in the 90s, right? In, Suharto, yeah. Suharto in 1998. So I'm wondering uh, well, about... No, not that. It's a resign from residency. Yeah, okay. But um, So I'm wondering about the young writers of your generation yeah. that, have come, that are writing after Suharto's regime. Yes. Are, are there many writers and are... Uh, so many writers that uh, bloom uh, the, uh, after the days of Suharto. I think the democracy situation is uh, clear to the uh, rise of the young uh, writers' generation in Indonesia. You know, I, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, um, this came to my mind when you said, Atish, um, he wanted to go someplace without history, like right, right. America or Australia. No, no, like Canada and New Zealand. I was, I was thinking, whenever I sit on, um, and this is no, this is not an, um, I speak not against the programming of this book festival. But I've noticed that at many book festivals, when I sit on these panels where we're talking about the relationship between the human and the national and yeah. sort of the political backdrop and so forth, there are never any white American novelists on the panel. And it's funny because their, their absence begs the question, but aren't novels about white American families also Exist, existing in context and with a landscape that has been shaped by the history and the policies and the laws and the corruption and the heartbreak and the triumphs of the country itself. So we don't, we, we would read about a middle class Ghanaian family and certainly this happened when my book was received and immediately sort of pry into the, well is Ghana a political country? Are there wars there? Is the, is the government stable? But we, we would read, it occurs to me now, about a middle class American family and not ask well, did they inherit their house because their forefathers were slave owners? Like, what were the American policies that led to the existence of this family? And I'm wondering why not. Oh. I nominate you to answer that <laughs> question. Like, why? Why not? Surely, surely in any family history, there is the, the, the state and its history and its favoritisms and its cruelties and its yeah. Any, any in the thought, background. Anybody in the audience want to want to take that? Okay, but if I mean, you I do wonder... that, when you ask me the next question, I'm going to be like, anyone <laughs> in the audience want to take my question? But it's an open question. It is. It but is. I, uh, but I wonder if American writers are are um, taking that into account or writing uh, novels that include that kind of back background or that kind of. Uh... No, no, no. They may well be. They're just never on the panel to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Wait, someone, look, I think I see a hand. Yeah, yeah. Will you stand up, sweetheart? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What's your name? Jacqueline. Jacqueline? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, look, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Good use of English. Good use of English. Oh no, it's very close. You are in range. <laughs> it's in frame. Yeah. 
Indeed. Thank you. Well, let's keep it uh, open to the audience. Any other questions for the authors? Really done. Any other comments? Well, then I'm going to have to tell you that I've been on book tour for a really long time. And I developed this rule that if I don't receive any questions, I won't sign any books. And I'm <laughs> extending that to my panelists as well. One question from, to any one of us, and we will all sign books. But if we have none, we just leave. <laughs> yes. OK. Next question. <laughs> but, Patricia asks, when am I going to write my next book? I am writing, well, I am writing the book now. I think of the next book as the third one. <laughs> um, when, when you will read it is a question that I cannot answer, indeed. <laughs> yes. I want this one. Yeah. To, to, to write against a place, you mean? When, does when it, does she's it, outside of China, then she, when she's in America, then she writes about China when she's in China. So, she's no, absolutely. I mean, for me, the, the power of, of writing against a place has been something that I've developed. I, I, I lived in India for eight years and almost hardly leaving and wrote books out of India and found that actually I had lost something, that I had, there was a certain kind of, it was, distance is too simple a word for it, but it was actually like the action of kind of memory and of, 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 of. It, it was, it, it was a very strange thing because it was, there was no way that I could be aware of it. I, mm. I almost felt like a kind of desire to write something Proustian about the, that process, but the power of one's material and I think a certain kind of dispassionate quality, a clarity, the things that come, I, I've, for me, it, it works on me um, very intensely when that distance is set between, um, a, between, between a place and where I'm writing. And for me, it's that I'm making the place up. So I'm not, if I wanted to write nonfiction, then I would go to the place and take impeccable notes and, and do interviews and so forth. Exactly. But because I'm writing, a, do you know what I mean? No, because I'm writing, I love what you say, against the place. When I'm writing about Ghana, I find that it's easiest to do when I'm not there because ultimately the Ghana, you should not come to Ghana, must go to encounter Ghana. You should either read nonfiction or better yet, go to Ghana. But what I can offer is the Ghana that exists, the Ghana of my novel, the, the Ghana that belongs to the human beings in this novel. And it is of course not a Ghana that was founded in 1943 instead of 1957. I'm faithful to the facts on the ground, but it's an, it's an invention. And so it's easy, I find it easiest to invent when I'm not in the place that I'm inventing. And Eka, uh, you, you live? I am uh, an Indonesian. I live in Indonesia and I write about Indonesia. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when, when, when I wrote the novel, I just want to write a kind of uh, a joke about historical novel to one of uh, some of my friends. So I think. Even if I, I live in Indonesia and you know, uh, tell about, tell about Indonesian, I think I have to uh, make a small distance from everything around me. So I think I can make a joke about ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question? There, there was one right. We're here, and then we'll go there. Okay. Yeah. For me, it's, it's very easy. I know everyone's going to hate it. So I just start, no, that's just, I start from the position that I'm going to piss somebody off. And if I don't, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. So I, I, I Do you want it, to piss the Nigerians and the Ghanaians off <laughs> at the same time? It's, um, yeah. 
it's safer to piss off the Ghanaians than the Nigerians, <laughs> but, but there's just no way around it. There's just absolutely no way around it. You, you know, I went to Ghana when I was 15 years old, and the flight used to go through Nigeria. Uh -huh. Yeah, and stop but, for the fuel. But they, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but they had recently, British Airways had declared, I mean, Heathrow had declared Nigerian Airways unsafe to land in England. So they declared British Airways unsafe to land in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love us. Yeah. But, but, I, but in all seriousness, I, we, we're novelists. You know, we're, we're, we're not historians. And if I were a historian, then I would feel beholden to everybody else's opinion and the received wisdom and so on and so forth. But I'm not. Eko, what about you in, in, in Indonesia? Um, What's the response? Uh, the response of the novel? Yeah. No, I think politically they are, it's okay. There's no, no, uh, no, res no, bitter, no bitter, uh, response. But, you know, uh, when the book is published in 2002, uh, the situation is uh, uh, relatively open and democracy is uh, there. So I think there's nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. And Atish? Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that I think that books that matter should should get on the people's skin a bit. I think that it uh, you know if it, and in India I feel very much that there's this great desire to to write about obscurity because uh, there are certain things that are off limits and uh, the nearer you come to the bone, the more uh, right. the more hysteria you provoke. Do you worry more about pissing off Indians or Pakistan? I, I try to get them both. In <laughs> Okay. Like, I have to say, the first line that you read, but she didn't have the money, I was like, I think I want that to be the title of my next book. <laughs> Just loved it, but she didn't have the money. What about reading the first line of the novel? The first line? Yeah, uh, of the whole novel, in the beginning. <laughs> Here you go. No, it's it. no, it's it. It's from first... Uh, of uh, first page of the beauty is a wound. Uh, I love this uh, scene because I think uh, it's uh, tell you about the nature of the novel. One afternoon on a weekend in March, Devi Ayu rose from her grave after being dead for 21 years. Okay. <laughs> All right. nice. A shepherd boy awakening from his nap under a pringapenny tree peed in his sword and scream and his four sheep ran up haphazardly in between stones and wooden grape markers as if a tiger had been thrown into their midst. <laughs> it all started with a noise coming from an old grape with an unmarked tombstone covered in knee-high grass. But everybody knew it was Dewi Ayu's grape. She had passed away at 52, rose again after being dead for 21 years, and from that point on, nobody knows exactly how to calculate her age. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question over there, I think, with somebody. That was you. What's that? Have, have, I, li have I lived in... I, I, I always say no to that question, just to keep it simple. But my, my mother has lived there for 15 years, and it's where my father's from. And so I, I go there twice a year, every year. And Tai, you live in Berlin now? More or less. More or less? Yeah. Like, I think my name is Thank you. A moment. For, uh, we have a time for a few more questions, and then we'll do a book signing outside. One more question. No more questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, thank you all. One more question. Can Tai says question. one more. Yeah, come on. Let me.
Do we have a short answer from anyone on that? And, and then we can carry on at the book signing table. I think we'll have to do I that outside. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and I'll see you, see you in the lobby. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, no,